And that's after a look at the news this New Year's Eve with Nicholas Witchell. This is BBC One. It's five past ten. The government has ruled out emergency measures to rescue the British economy. The Conservative Party chairman, Chris Patton, has said everything is in place for recovery. Labour says the government is bankrupt of ideas. And two men have been charged tonight in connection with the acid attack in Banbury on Mrs Joan Cooper. Good evening. With the election year about to begin, ministers have been making it clear today that there will be no panic measures to try to lift the British economy out of recession. The Conservative Party chairman Chris Patton has said the government will hold its nerve. Earlier, the Chancellor, Norman Lamont, said he wouldn't be pressured into taking emergency steps to kick-start the economy. And in his New Year statement tomorrow, the Prime Minister is expected to rule out quick fixes to the economy. But for the shadow cabinet, Michael Meacher has accused the Chancellor of being bankrupt as British industry bleeds. A Conservative Party appeal for unity behind the Chancellor will be reinforced tomorrow in the Prime Minister's New Year message. It's likely to be the strongest warning yet that the Tories shouldn't be panicked into short-term measures. Party Chairman Chris Patton thinks a hurried response before the budget could be disastrous for the country. I certainly don't want to see the economy uh, kicked into a mess and I certainly think that it's important to look before you leap. Uh, what is vital uh, is that we have the fundamentals in place for economic recovery. Nobody seriously doubts that uh, and it's important to hold our nerve. It's important to stick resolutely behind a Chancellor who has been extremely courageous. It is not easy uh, running the economy during a world recession. Pressure on the government for a devaluation of sterling within the ERM reflects the view that a realignment could ease interest rates and help British exporters. But the employers' organisation, the CBI, which today has cut its forecast for future growth, still backs the Chancellor in rejecting any short-term move to cut the value of the pound. We've tried debasing our currency uh, over decades and it doesn't work. We simply wind up importing inflation and exporting jobs, and that's exactly what we don't want to see. Our economy, fundamentally, is in much sounder shape than is widely recognised. But the Labour leadership believes the repercussions of the recession will provide every opportunity for an unrelenting attack on the government. The Chancellor is like a man mesmerised by the magnitude of the crisis he and John Major have created. He is bankrupt. He has nothing new to say, no new policies to offer, while Britain lies bleeding with the worst recession since the war. Mr Major has had Christmas and New Year to ponder on the biggest political decision of his life, the date of the general election. He has 28 Thursdays to choose from between now and the deadline of July the 9th. It's likely to be the budget that'll dictate the timing of the election. And Mr Major uses his New Year message to reinforce the Tory party commitment to low taxation. Indeed, it looks increasingly likely as if the government will have to rely on the Chancellor to restore Tory party fortunes. In the city, share prices recorded their biggest rise of 1991 today. It followed last night's all-time high on Wall Street. At the close, the 100 share index was up 73.1 at 2493.1. The rise added £13 billion to share values. Two men have tonight been charged by police investigating the acid attack on a 74-year-old widow at Banbury in Oxfordshire. The men are aged 22 and 17. They will appear in court tomorrow. Joan Cooper was left burnt and temporarily blinded by the attack on Friday evening. She's on a life support machine in hospital. Her condition is described as poor but stable. Mrs Cooper was punched in the stomach and had kettle de scaler poured on her face. According to doctors, it's still too early to say whether she'll lose her sight. Her ordeal began when two men called at her home in Banbury, asking for water for their car. When she returned with it, they attacked her and ransacked the house. The police described it as a callous and pointless attack. They appealed to the public for help in catching those responsible. The two men arrested in connection with the attack have been charged with aggravated burglary and grievous bodily harm. They're aged 22 and 17. Both come from the Banbury area. 
They'll appear before magistrates at a special court tomorrow morning. In Moscow, where the new year arrived 10 minutes ago, Russians have been queuing in record numbers in an effort to beat huge price rises. Basic foods will cost up to five times more when the shops reopen the day after tomorrow. Ukraine has been forced to lift price controls at the same time after it failed to persuade Boris Yeltsin to delay his economic reforms. At the end of a year of tumultuous change here, Russians have been giving thanks that 1991 brought the final death of communism, but also saying prayers that 1992 will bring some relief from their economic misery. Certainly it will not be a happy start to the new year for millions of shoppers who face huge price rises the day after tomorrow. That's when Boris Yeltsin begins his shock therapy for the economy. Some goods have already gone up. In this shop, eggs cost ten times more than they did, but at least it means they're now in relatively plentiful supply. Obviously, there's a danger in raising prices, said Gennady Boboulis today, Mr Yeltsin's right-hand man. Especially, he said, since we have opponents who openly challenge our reforms and who'll take advantage of anything to provoke trouble. In fact, many Russians have already been stocking up with cheaper goods from other republics. These people are just back from a productive train journey to neighboring Ukraine. The Ukrainian government have been worried that there'll be a full-scale invasion of Russian shoppers on Thursday. So now, reluctantly, they're raising their prices on the same day as Russia does. But as a way of protecting their economy, the Ukrainians are also issuing these coupons, a forerunner to a separate Ukrainian currency, which would ultimately replace the ruble. As they welcome in the new year in Red Square tonight, Boris Yeltsin has promised that his reforms will start to pay dividends within six to eight months. But old guard communists say the free market will never succeed here. They came to mourn the passing of the Soviet Union, proudly carrying the red flag, which now no longer flies over the Kremlin, of course. It's the Russian tricolor which has been there since Christmas Day. 1992 should demonstrate whether the new Commonwealth of Independent States will work and how successfully it can repair the damage done by seven decades of communist dictatorship. Ben Brown, BBC News, Moscow. Rebel forces in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia are said to be massing for a final assault on the parliament building in Tbilisi, where President Gamsa Kurdia has taken refuge. The rebels claim that the president has had two of his supporters shot for trying to negotiate a ceasefire. From Tbilisi, Carol Walker reports. Both sides have been calling in reinforcements after the fierce fighting yesterday, which resulted in stalemate. The opposition has several more armoured personnel carriers and for the first time some heavy artillery, including two howitzer field guns. They appear to be preparing for a fresh offensive. Their leader, Tengiz Kitovani, says the bloodshed must not be allowed to continue indefinitely. According to Ministry of Health officials, eight people died and more than 50 were wounded yesterday. Though they themselves admit the real toll is almost certainly higher. At this hospital alone, Doctors have treated more than 170 casualties this week, many of them civilians, caught in sniper fire. There were wounds of legs and hands and chest wall and abdomen and head, but our department is a department of vascular surgery. So many people we are uh, with damaging of hands and legs. Commandant Govan Sadze, who was head of all Tbilisi's militia forces, was shot in the leg when he tried to keep the opposing forces apart and open a dialogue between them on the day this conflict began. A number of buildings around the parliament are still smouldering. During a brief lull in the fighting today, many civilians who've been trapped in their homes for several days packed their belongings and left. One woman said she could not believe what was happening. Georgians fighting Georgians. While the opposition prepared their new weapons, President Gamsakhodia is reported to have called in more tanks it will not be easy to penetrate his stronghold in the parliament with a bunker built to withstand a nuclear attack. Carol Walker, BBC News, Tbilisi. Terry Waite has said he's pleased and honoured to be included in the New Year honours list. He and the other former hostages, John McCarthy, Jackie Mann and Brian Keenan, have each been awarded the CBE in recognition of their courage and fortitude. Jenny Bond reports. It's six weeks since Terry Waite arrived back on home soil. 
He's now on holiday in the Bahamas, but he said he was pleased and honoured by the award. His brother said no one had expected it. I'm delighted uh, with the award that Terry's got, and I think it's a very fitting tribute for the great ordeal that all the hostages went through. John McCarthy, who was freed in August, is also away, but he's said to be delighted. And from his home in Cyprus, Jackie Mann said he was feeling higher than Concord, but he was taking things easy. My wife and I are celebrating our own quiet away at the moment. But we'll, we'll probably have a party tomorrow or something of that kind. Brian Keenan, freed last year, has dedicated his award to those who campaigned for his release. And he's disclosed that he plans to go back to Lebanon next year. Sir Brian Rick says he hopes his seat in the Lords will give him a new platform to speak up for the mentally handicapped. And the star of Minder, now an OBE, thinks Arthur Daly would have mixed feelings about it. I think he'd be a bit cross, because I don't think he'll get one, but I think he'll start knocking out replicas of them marked um, Old British Entrepreneur, and he'd charge VAT on it too. The veteran film star Dirk Bogart says his knighthood is a compliment to his profession. And the world of opera has a new dame, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. The director general of the BBC, Michael Checkland, also becomes a knight. The cameraman who lost an arm filming this explosion in Ethiopia seven months ago has been made an MBE. Mo Amin of Viz News is now back at work with his new arm. The sporting honours include a knighthood for Colin Cowdery, now chairman of the International Cricket Council, and an MBE for golfer Ian Woosnam, winner of the US Masters. To win my first major tournament and uh, it's a, a, like a dream come true, and then to get an MBE is a, a, like another dream come true, so everything's happened for me this year. There's an MBE too for the Scottish athlete Liz McColgan, who was back in top form this year, just months after having a baby. England's soccer captain Gary Lineker is made an OBE, as is rugby's Will Carling, who says it's an honour for the whole team. Mother Teresa of Calcutta is still said to be seriously ill after heart surgery at an American hospital. She was admitted to hospital after Christmas. Doctors say that Mother Teresa, who's 81, has made progress but is still causing concern. Mother Teresa was in Tijuana, Mexico, visiting the local community of her missionaries of charity when she fell ill. After being urged by religious and medical advisors to seek treatment, she returned to California on Christmas Eve, where she was admitted to the Scripps Clinic with bacterial pneumonia. Two days later, she suffered a minor heart attack and had to be treated by surgery to clear blockages in her coronary arteries. According to her doctors, Mother Teresa is seriously ill, but making progress. If her condition continues to improve, she will be hospitalized for about another week to treat her heart, her pneumonia, and to watch for potential new problems. Mother Teresa, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, has received a personal message and prayer from Pope John Paul, along with many hundreds of calls from well-wishers. In a message typical of her thought for others, Mother Teresa said last night she wished all blessings for the new year. 1992. Richard Quest, BBC News, New York. Javier Perez de Cuellar steps down as Secretary General of the United Nations tonight after 10 years in the job. During his years in office, the prestige of the United Nations has risen sharply. Its effectiveness in influencing world events was highlighted during the Gulf War. In the last few months, the organization has played a central role in freeing the Beirut hostages. Serbian leaders and the Yugoslav army have agreed to support the United Nations peace plan. After meeting the UN Special Envoy, Cyrus Vance, the Serbs said that the deployment of a UN peacekeeping force now depended entirely on the Croats. As the peace talks continued, the fighting intensified in Croatia. Near Otacet, 80 miles south of Zagreb, Croatian villages were hit by rocket fire and a Serbian village, captured yesterday by the Croats, suffered a heavy counter-bombardment by the Serbs. The Croats' frontline commander had to speak above incoming fire as he claimed there had been no ill treatment of Serbian prisoners. Across the front line, but especially in the central sector, the year is ending with an ominous upsurge of fighting.
At the same time, the UN Special Envoy, Cyrus Vance, was trying once more at talks in Belgrade to win agreement for the deployment of a peacekeeping force. He reported progress, but words and actions seemed to contradict each other. Indeed, the fighting even seems more severe than the last time that I was here. It seems that uh, perhaps on both sides they are breaking the ceasefire. Certainly they were in the central sector, and in the kind of crossfire we witnessed today, a peacekeeping force has never been more necessary or harder to deploy. The Croats are trying to reconquer some of the territory they've lost, but they're making scant progress, and the town of Karlovac, day by day, is taking a terrible pound. Martin Bell, BBC News, Karlovac. And in the besieged city of Dubrovnik, a New Year's Eve peace concert is taking place tonight. The city has been surrounded by Serbian troops for more than three months, and the concert organisers hope that it will help to lift morale. A New Year's peace mission to a city whose senseless destruction has shocked the world. Before their boat from Italy docked in Dubrovnik, the orchestra had been warned to watch out for sniper fire from the hills. Their tour party was the first since spring to be guided around this beautiful medieval city. 800 mortar shells and rockets have smashed in since. Only the city's coat of arms survive in one historic house, and the main street, haunt of pavement artists, displays cartoons of defiance in every wrecked shop window. The bell tower, which historically warned of enemy attack, today rang out Dubrovnik's welcome. Many people stayed out on the streets and relaxed for the first time since the attacks on Dubrovnik began three months ago. For the concert's organizers, this was a gesture to the warring parties and the world at large. They must be tolerant and they must live together, Serbian and Croatian, independently, yes, certainly, yes. But they must live together, they are neighbors. I think that not only the opinion within, within this country, within, uh, this, with, between the Serbs and the Croats is important to change, but also our attitudes outside about making peace possible. But now in its final run through, even the concert hit problems. The Toulouse Chamber Orchestra stepped in only after Britain's Royal Philharmonic called off on Foreign Office advice that they'd be unsafe. The spirit of reconciliation didn't allow for a duet between a Croat soprano and a Serb bass. The concert's organizers were told that he wasn't welcome here. But when rehearsals are over tonight, there will be one special finale for peace. Children from both sides of the ethnic divide will welcome in a happier new year for their city. Mike Donkin, BBC News, Dubrovnik. And finally, the main news again. The government has made it clear that there will be no emergency measures to try to ease the recession. Two men have been charged tonight in connection with the acid attack on Mrs Joan Cooper. And that's the news for 1991. From everybody at BBC News, we wish you a very happy and a peaceful new year. Good night. This is the BBC for the Eastern Counties. Now the regional news with Stuart White. Good evening. A legal loophole has allowed a Suffolk man to avoid paying his poll tax bill for £242. Don Pollard from Hepworth proved to magistrates in Bury St Edmunds that under the 1968 Civil Evidence Act, the local council hadn't followed proper legal procedure. He challenged the use of computer printouts as evidence. St Edmundsbury Council says the decision could have implications for other local authorities. A homeless man from Hertfordshire is back on the streets today after his caravan was destroyed by fire at Buntingford near Royston. The burnt remains are all that is left of the home of unemployed Kenny Evans. He bought the caravan a few weeks ago after living in his car on the A10. He put it at the junction of the A507 and the A10, which used to be a traveller's site. Late last night, he returned to the caravan and found it ablaze. Police are treating the fire as suspicious. 
Water supplies to thousands of homes at Whittam in Essex are expected to be restored tonight after a mains burst. Supplies ran out early this morning when a 21-inch pipe burst next to the river Blackwater. Engineers had to shore up the river banks before repair work could be carried out. Water tankers were brought in to Whittam to help with supplies. The Mid-Essex Water Company says it hopes to finish repairs tonight. A new £10 million cancer treatment unit is to be built at the Lister Hospital in Stevenage. The unit is part of an £11.5 million package, which also includes an inpatient assessment unit for the mentally ill and a new health clinic in Baldock. That's the news this evening. Just a reminder, there'll be more regional news on your BBC local radio stations between now and midnight, and we'll be back tomorrow lunchtime. From all of us here, we'll see you next year, and have a very happy New Year. Good night. Good evening. Well, 1991 does not look set to go out with a whimper, but with the most definite bang as far as the weather's concerned, a weather warning in effect for Scotland and for Northern Ireland. Due to gales and severe gales overnight, gusting between 60 and 80 miles per hour that wind, so that could obviously cause some structural damage. Now, the culprit is this intense low-pressure area, which is going to be scuttling across close to the north of Scotland tonight, bringing the strongest winds up in the north. There are the wind arrows. Gales and severe gales battering in across Northern Ireland and Scotland. There could be some very strong winds over the northern parts of England, particularly up on the hills too, causing some fairly difficult driving conditions at times. Indeed, there's another weather warning out for the combination, not only of the wind, but the heavy rain likely, which will cause really some fairly horrendous driving conditions in Scotland and Northern Ireland mainly, because that's where the rain will be moving in tonight, some of it quite heavy and persistent, crossing through Scotland and down through Northern Ireland. By the early hours of uh, tomorrow morning, we'll see most of the rain in the far north of England and southern Scotland, with clearer skies following to the north there. Temperature's not too low by the end of the night, but there could just be a touch of ground frost in some parts of the southeast in the next few hours, but that should lift as the winds pick up. As far as New, Day, New Year's Day's weather's concerned, that band of cloud and rain affecting Northern Ireland, Northern England and southern parts of Scotland, for most of England and Wales, fairly dry. There could even be some bright weather around in the east, but a lot of cloud around generally, and that's probably going to be thick enough in these western areas to give a little bit of rain and drizzle. And then later on tomorrow, after the bright start in northern Scotland, we'll see this cloud gathering a pace and beginning to push back up through Northern Ireland and Scotland, so turning out wet and windy once again there. Generally, quite mild, particularly in the south, especially if any brightness comes through, but obviously with the wind still being quite strong, it's going to feel rather cooler than 9 or 11 degrees might at first look. Well, looking at the weather maps for the next couple of days, this is the one for tomorrow, and then as we move through to Thursday, that weather front begins to buckle northwards. But then, the day after that, we'll see it begin to move back south again. It really can't make its mind up. But it will mean that most of the wet weather will be up in Scotland over Thursday and through Friday as well. Still quite windy weather, quite mild, particularly in the south. But then later on Friday, that rain moving southwards and brighter, colder weather beginning to push in across most parts of Scotland. It'll still be windy over many parts of the country. That's it. I'll say Happy New Year. <laughs>